So basically today I wanted to cover a number of issues that lie at the intersection of TAFTA, this trade agreement, um, and implications for our climate and environment, and was going to touch on four different issues quite quickly. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, essentially I'll go through uh, some eco-labeling questions, talk about natural gas exports and fracking, talk a little bit more about the investment rules we've been hearing about, and then on this environment slash sustainable development chapter that may be included in this pact. But uh, before going into the substance on the next slide, I would just um, point everyone to a little bit of the process. And in the beginning, Lori mentioned the uh, 600 industry advisors to the US Trade Representative. This is a screenshot of the energy advisors to the US Trade Representative. And because I'm going to be talking a lot about energy today, I thought it'd be helpful to get a sense of who is really actively engaged in helping to shape uh, US Trade Representative's energy policy. So not on this list somehow is the Sierra Club or other of our allies, but we do have National Coal Council, Halliburton, GE, Chevron, Caterpillar, and, and a whole host of, the list goes on, other um, of the major actors in the fossil fuel industry. And I, I just think it's important for us to keep this slide in mind. When we look at the other slides, um, it's you know, Citigroup and Walmart and Pfizer, and, and these are all public, so we can look at them on the USTR's um, energy advisory uh, on their USTR's website. And there, there are some uh, NGO representatives as well, labor representatives, but we are far outweighed by this very strong industry dominant um, perspective on the advisory panels. So keep that in mind as I talk about some of the energy issues uh, that we may see coming up in TAFTA. So a little bit on eco-labeling first. Um, eco-labels can be an effective tool to give consumers more information about the energy content, the carbon content of the products that they choose, which in turn may allow consumers to make better decisions about the products that they consume, may push manufacturers to make more energy efficient products. Uh, I think it's definitely not uh, the major component, but it's certainly a component of uh, a strategy to deal with energy efficiency and to deal with climate change. So on the screen here are just three examples of different energy labels. Uh, on the left side, there's the US Energy Star label. It marks products that meet high uh, energy efficiency performance standards. The second label is an EU energy label. Uh, and actually, the EU requires that light bulbs, cars, a range of electrical appliances carry this label, describing, again, their respective energy performance of these products. And the third label is an example of a carbon label. Uh, this one is one used in the UK. Um, and this essentially aims, although not perfectly, but it aims to calculate the carbon footprint of a product, which is essentially the total carbon content used in, in the life cycle of the production of the carbon of the product. And I think all of these labels could potentially be at risk by TAFTA, by this trade agreement. And that's because environmental labeling like other labeling and standards, falls within the scope of what will likely be the chapter in this agreement called Technical Barriers to Trade that some other panelists have mentioned. And while there already exists a WTO agreement on technical barriers to trade, the US-EU high-level working group suggested and proposed that this agreement include a Technical Barriers to Trade plus chapter. We don't exactly know what that plus means, but I think it does imply that there can be even less space, less flexibility for these types of environmental labeling, carbon labeling programs, because the chapter would likely build on the existing WTO commitments that already require labels and standards not be more trade restrictive than necessary, not present unnecessary obstacles to international trade, which I think are pretty arbitrary tests that these labels might have to follow. On the next slide, just a point that the uh, idea that some of these energy carbon labeling targets labels might be targeted is not entirely far-fetched. Um, Carol advised us to read the 2013 report on technical barriers to trade that's up on the screen. And in fact, the US Trade Representative does signal out that uh, voluntary label labeling programs related to energy efficiency have created substantial barriers to trade. So we do see, again, these labels as, as one part um, of the context for addressing energy efficiency and climate change that must not be weakened or undermined by this trade pact. On the next slide, just turning to another issue around um, natural gas exports and fracking and how that could be implicated by this trade pact. So 
a little bit of background on this. Um, fracking in the United States, as you can see, this map shows some of the major shale gas plays. Fracking is the process by which we dig deep into the ground with chemicals and sand um, and millions of gallons of water to unleash natural gas. There's been um, a burst of fracking activity in the United States that has uh, created an enormous amount of supply of natural gas in the United States that has driven down prices of natural gas to a record low. Um, but all with really significant harm to the environment with contaminated water, air pollution, methane leaks that are very, uh, contribute significantly to climate change and more. But this new supply and the very low price of gas has also allowed the United States for the first time ever to become a major exporter of US natural gas. On the next slide, we'll see that countries in Europe have actually taken a much more cautious approach to fracking. Uh, in part because of many of the concerns about the impacts of fracking on air, land, and water. So this map actually just shows, it's a little bit hard to see maybe, but um, European Union countries' potential for gas production, but where fracking is banned, where it's allowed, and where it's beginning. And I think what's important to note here is that, for example, there are significant gas reserves under France, but France has a strict moratorium or ban on fracking in place in large part, again, because of the concerns about the environmental and health impacts. Other countries like Netherlands, Luxembourg, Bulgaria all have moratoriums in place. Australia allows for fracking, um, but the cost of complying with environmental regulations makes it essentially uneconomic. And while there are some countries in Eastern Europe, like Poland, that have begun um, to explore, there is uh, uncertainty about what the potential there is. So basically, European Union is in the exact opposite position of the United States, where they have quite a low supply domestically and are therefore uh, looking, they're a major importer of natural gas and looking to import fracked gas from the United States. The next slide. So the natural gas industry is equally eager to export fracked gas from the United States to the European Union and elsewhere, in part because they can earn a lot more cash. So this map just shows that where the price of natural gas, again, because of all that supply in the United States is about $3 per unit in Belgium, uh, it's almost $10, so more than three times more. So the natural gas industry is, is quite eager. Um, I, they're so eager, in fact, that they are building export terminals all across the United States. There's about 25 export terminals being proposed across the United States to, again, export fracked gas to foreign markets. And we have a lot of concerns about that for a number of reasons. Again, more exports means more fracking means more pipelines, which leak methane. It means more infrastructure investment in fossil fuels in a time when we should be really uh, fully transitioning and committed to transitioning to clean energy. It means higher electricity prices that affect consumers, but also could make um, coal a more cost competitive option once again. And here's the additional trade hook, is that normally, while the United States Department of Energy has to do a public interest determination when it wants to export any natural gas it has to look at what are the environmental and economic implications of exporting. That requirement is waived for any country with which we have a free trade agreement in place that calls for something called national treatment for trade in gas. So that's the point of our free trade agreements again, trade agreements, it's about expanding trade as much as possible, sort of no matter what, no questions asked. So we are very concerned that depending on how this, this agreement could be crafted, that again, deregulating our government's ability it would strip the Department of Energy of its ability to even examine whether exports are in the interest of the public. So no matter what you think about exports, no matter what you think about fracking, I think we could all agree at least that our government should have the ability to at least review and examine the impacts before forever ceding its ability. Next slide. Oh, Dig a little bit into these investment rules a little bit more. Um, so again, we've heard a little bit about this under the guise of increasing foreign investment, these investment rules and free trade agreements have given massive rights, massive privileges um, to foreign corporations, uh, such to the extent that foreign corporations are given the right to sue a government, the US or governments in the EU, for rights and policies that um, essentially reduce that the governments, that the corporations allege reduce their future profits. So this process of uh, Corporations being elevated to the level of nation states is called the investor state dispute settlement. Despite the advanced judicial systems in the US and the EU, the governments of the US and EU have suggested that uh, investor state will be included 
in this trade pact. And this is extremely concerning from an environment and climate standpoint, as well as other public interest policies, because of the massive proliferation of cases that we've seen over the years that directly challenge climate environmental policies put in place by governments. So just as one example, this screenshot is Lone Pine Resources, a U.S. energy firm based conveniently in Delaware, doesn't actually have operations in the United States, has actually all of its operations in Canada. But they used NAFTA, uh, NAFTA's investment chapter, to threaten to sue Canada for $250 million under a World Bank tribunal for Quebec's timeout on fracking. Quebec, after much civil society, public um, advocacy, put a timeout on fracking underneath the St. Lawrence River just to study the impacts. Lone Pine didn't like that, said it threatened their right to mine and uh, is threatening this investor state case on the Next slide, I just want to do a quick screenshot. Again, I kid you not, they actually did claim that the uh, timeout was an arbitrary, capricious, illegal revocation of the enterprise's valuable right to mine for oil and gas under the St. Lawrence River. So last time I checked, I didn't know that the right to mine existed, but here it is on paper being used by Lone Pine. So we think it's absolutely critical that this investor state system is, is not included um, in TAFTA and that we have very narrow rules that would close the door to this type of cases. Again, I focused on the natural gas industry, but it could be public health, consumer rights, labor, what have you. Just uh, last one, one or two minutes. This goes off something that Celeste was talking about earlier, and it's the two very different approaches that the US and the EU have taken to both their labor and environment chapters, which on the US hand have been binding and legally enforceable. And the EU's approach in its recent FTAs, free trade agreements, have been a trade and sustainable development chapter that has been really completely aspirational. So very quickly, just four elements that have been included in all recent U.S. free trade agreements in the environmental chapter has been a commitment to not waive or weaken environmental laws and policies, a commitment to uphold obligations in multilateral environmental agreements, Commitments to address conservation challenges in the region, like banning trade in illegally harvested timber and illegally taken wildlife. And they've agreed to have the, the chapters be enforceable, subject to dispute settlement, like all of the commercial chapters in the agreement, and subject to trade sanctions. The EU's approach in their trade and sustainable development chapter, which they seem to be proposing for TAFTA, does include commitments to not waive or weaken environmental laws and policies, but then they just reaffirm commitments to implementing the multilateral environmental agreements, and they just recognize the importance of tackling effort, conservation efforts like trade and illegally harvested timber. And the chapter, as I said, is not subject, it's not enforceable, it's not subject to trade sanctions, it's not, it's eleva it's, it's not elevated to the same level of importance as the other commercial chapters, but are just settled through consultations if there happens to be a problem. So this, I think, is one area, Celeste pointed out, where the U.S. does have um, really a more ambitious approach that needs not, not to be taken at face value, needs to be improved upon, but I think that'll be one area that we'll have to watch. Fossil fuel subsidies is just another that I would mention that could be incorporated into an environment or sustainable development chapter looking to um, phase out and, and really commit to the commitments that the EU and the U.S. have already made to phase out fossil fuel subsidies to the industry. I'm not going to go into this now, but on the final slide, just to reiterate um, one more, the sort of final set of recommendations, there's more than this. These are the ones that I focused on in this presentation but essentially ensuring that this chapter on technical barriers to trade, remember those labels, includes a very strong exception for environment and climate labeling, ensuring that the U.S. retains its ability to at least weigh whether exports are in the public interest, excluding investor state and broad investor protections, including an ambitious binding enforceable environment chapter and labor chapter, including commitments to phase out fossil fuel subsidies, and think back to the first slide, balancing industry, public, and CSO engagement in this process and agreeing to release all of the text publicly. Stop there. And that's my email. If you have any questions, please do follow up.